Bernstein in Copenhagen. So I am not, all right, the recording has started. So I was about to say that we're going to record this and whoever doesn't like it can say so now, but, but too late, I guess. You can leave if you don't like it. Um, so Mark said that, you know, people are welcome to ask questions during the talk. So feel free to unmute yourselves and ask questions. Um, and I think with that, I will not waste any more of his time. So Mark, please. Okay, everybody. Um, it's good to be here wherever I am and wherever you are. Uh, so, so this talk will be a uh, double feature uh, because there were, you know, sort of looking at the audience and thinking what would be interesting. And there were, there were actually two topics that I thought would be, you know, of interest to many people here. Uh, and each one of them has a core idea that I think can be conveyed relatively uh, simply or succinctly. Um, and then, you know, at the end, we can see where the discussion takes us and which is of more interest and maybe some will be of more interest to some than others. Uh, but, but actually, even though they're of a rather different nature, uh, these two topics are actually part of one larger theme that I'd like to just start out by sort of setting the context more broadly of this work. And over the last however many you know, recent years, um, the sort of growing movement within our fields of people investigating uh, how to better understand, characterize, and eventually control the dynamics of quantum antibody systems. Uh, and this takes on many different uh, flavors from very fundamental, looking for new types of uh, non-equilibrium phases and, and for example, non-equilibrium topological phenomena that may be very different from phenomena you could see in an equilibrium system. Uh, also fundamental questions about uh, dynamics of entanglement, thermalization of closed systems, about quantum measurements, uh, all the way to very practical things about how we can even operate you know, quantum devices and potential quantum information processing systems. So, so all this is coming together in I think a quite exciting uh, array of activities. Uh, and one particular part of this, which has grown to prominence is, has been the study of periodically driven systems. Now you may ask, you know, why periodically driven and not some other kind of driving should we consider? Um, well, for one thing, it just gives some kind of framework to think within. If you ask, you know, what's, what could a general driven system do? The question's a little bit too broad. So, you know, one, one kind of structure we can place down is ask, you know, what does vertically driven system do? Uh, and lots of interesting insights have come out of that. Uh, but periodically driven systems as one specific example of the type of controlled many body system uh, are plagued by kind of an issue, problem or issue which is that if you just think about it, you take some piece of material, whatever it is, and you shine your laser on it, uh, you know, what's gonna happen? The system's gonna absorb energy and, and start to heat up. Uh, and so generically, if you just take some interacting many body system and you start driving it, uh, after a long time, it's gonna tend towards some not very interesting high entropy density state. Sometimes it's called infinite temperature, whatever you wanna call it, but basically, uh, you're going to blow up your system. Uh, so if we want to do something more interesting than just melt samples, uh, we need to think about, you know, what, under what conditions or what context can we get something interesting out of a driven many body system. And uh, there are various means for seeing something meaningful in a driven many body system. Uh, and you kind of broadly characterize it into three you know, strategies or means for, for seeing something in this context. Uh, the first, uh, as listed here, is to look at some kind of transient dynamics. And, and the idea here is that, although it may be the case that at a very long time, the system is going to you know, absorb all this energy and, and go crazy, uh, but if you can identify appropriate conditions, there may be parameter regimes where for some very long period of time, the system gets into some interesting state, which is different from equilibrium. Uh, and during that window, you can perform your experiments, do whatever it is you wanna to do to it, uh, study the system, and then, okay, if we would leave the drive on maybe longer, it'll keep heating up, or then we can just turn it off and, and be done. 
So, so one regime of interest is this sort of pre-thermal or transient regime. Uh, and in the first part of the talk, I'm going to be discussing sort of a new paradigm for pre-thermal dynamics that actually makes use of the heating that comes with these systems. So although initially I told you this is a, a problem that plagues driven systems that they want to heat up, the message of the first part of the talk is going to be that there's actually a, a context where we can use that tendency of the system to heat up uh, and lose memory of its initial conditions to drive it into an actually more interesting state than it was before. And it can reveal some universal properties, which I'll, I'll tell you about here. Um, another way to get something non-trivial out of the driven system, which I won't be talking about today, but you know, people are interested and happy to discuss various things about it, uh, is in strongly disordered systems, many body localization under appropriate conditions can survive in the presence of a drive. Uh, so then even in the long time limit, you may find some non-trivial behavior or some even phase structure left over in the system. Uh, so that's another way of seeing something interesting in a many body system. Uh, and the third paradigm being considered, and this is where the second half of the talk will uh, focus, is that the statement that the system is gonna heat up and eventually melt or something bad will happen to it is really a statement about a closed interacting system because the drive can put in energy and then energy has nowhere to go except to distribute among all the degrees of freedom in the system. But if we're talking about a driven open system, it's connected to a bath and the bath is much larger than the system itself, then you know energy can come in from the drive and it can be dissipated back out and the system may end up in a steady state where energy input and output are balanced. And then the question is under what conditions will we find something interesting about that steady state? Uh, so the second half of the talk will be uh, actually about sort of a method for describing open systems. It, initially, the motivation for this work was a study of a periodically driven system, but actually the method I'll talk about applies also to non-driven systems. It's a very general approach for describing the dynamics of many body open systems. Okay, so that basically sets up the structure of the talk. So the first half will be something about these pre-thermal dynamics, second half about Markovian dynamics of open many-body systems. Okay, so you know, part one is about pre-thermal or transient dynamics. And I want to start with a statement that has been uh, very influential in the field and um, provided a lot of, at least in a theoretical, from a theoretical point of view, a uh, very powerful framework for thinking about this pre-thermalization. Um, the statement is that if we drive the system with a very high frequency, uh, and here high frequency means that H bar omega, or omega is the frequency of the drive, is large compared to any local energy scale in the Hamiltonian problem, uh, then the rate at which the system can absorb energy is exponentially suppressed in this frequency. And the reason you can basically see in this picture is that the system has to absorb energy in, in packets, photons absorbed with energy H bar omega. But if the local energy scale say has this size W, the bandwidth or something of some single particle excitations, then in order to absorb one photon, that would require a high order many body rearrangement of lots of particles. Uh, so at least from a perturbative point of view, you can see that uh, this high order process would have a very small rate at which it occurs. Um, so there is this notion that at high frequencies, uh, we can drive the system and it will take a very long time before it starts absorbing energy. But on this time window, before it really starts to heat up, its dynamics are governed not by a static Hamiltonian, but by this time dependent one. Uh, and therefore the dynamics of the system may be modified compared to what they would have been without the drive. And this gives us this pre-thermal time window when uh, you know, some kind of new behavior can be accessed. But one issue that I would like to point out with this is that while this idea of a high frequency driving regime with exponentially suppressed heating is very fruitful theoretically, uh, it's actually fake. Uh, because there's no physical system which has a finite bandwidth. Uh, so although we can write down a model, it looks something like this picture, 
Uh, in fact, there'll always be some higher bands, higher energy degrees of freedom that can be coupled to by this. So, so this high frequency limit, not totally well defined in, in an actual physical system, uh, but there are regimes where it can be useful. For example, if this frequency is large compared to the bandwidth here, and the gap to higher bands is even much larger than that. And maybe some kind of combination of a low frequency and high frequency that you can use. So uh, this is some context about, you know, most many works about pre-thermalization are thinking about this regime of a high frequency drive. What I want to tell you about now is not this, but rather something that occurs when the drive frequency is comparable to the bandwidth here. Uh, and in, th in this sense, this uh, energy absorption will not be exponentially suppressed, uh, but we'll see that nonetheless, we'll end up in a very interesting type of quasi steady state. Okay, and a key underlying idea uh, behind what I'm going to tell you is has to do with the topology of the single particle band structure of a periodically driven system. Uh, and the key point here is that if I have a periodically driven system, then of course there's no energy conservation anymore because the Hamiltonian depends on time. But in a periodically driven system, there still is a discrete time translation symmetry. Uh, and the conserved quantity associated with this discrete time translation symmetry is so-called quasi energy. Uh, and just like in, if I have continuous translation symmetry in space, we have conserved momentum, but in the lattice, we have crystal momentum and has a Brillouin zone. So momentum becomes a periodic variable. So that's what you would see here on the left. Think about band structure in a crystal. We have momentum, which lives on a circle. It's 1D, uh, that's the Brillouin zone. Uh, and then we have energies of these bands and, and the energy is periodic as we go around the Brillouin zone. Uh, for a periodically driven system, now there's also a Brillouin zone for energy because I have a discrete translation symmetry in time. So the energy like variable is also periodic. Um, therefore, the, the band structure of a periodically driven system on a lattice um, is defined instead of being on a cylinder as I drew on the left here, it's actually on a torus because the energy variable is periodic as well as the momentum variable. Uh, and this opens a possibility that we could have bands which wind around this torus in some non-trivial way, which is completely different from what you could ever get in equilibrium, uh, because in a non-driven system, there's no sense in which you could wind around in this energy direction. Um, and this new sort of unique feature of the topology of floquet bands has uh, some very important consequences for, for transport, for example, which I'll discuss now. But actually, before I tell you more about uh, what the consequences of this kind of winding okay bands are, are there any questions about anything up, up till here? Okay, if not good. So, so let me then tell you what, what actually is the physics of this situation where I have a floquet band that winds around the quasi energy bill on so. Uh, so this quasi energy winding is related to quantized adiabatic transport, which is a phenomenon that goes back to Fowlis in the early eighties. Um, and it's, it's actually sort of a new interpretation of this phenomenon or a new way of looking at it that we can get by thinking in terms of this floquet band structure. And if we take the torus, which was here, uh, and then just open it up and look at what, are this, what does this band that winds around the torus look like? You see, it, it, it looks like a chiral mode. Uh, so remembering that this both directions here are periodic, that you know, the crystal momentum with a circle here, quasi energy there, this point up here is in fact the same as this one. That's how I know that this band wound around the torus. Um, but just by eye, you can see that there's some average slope of this band. Uh, and just like for regular you know, band structure, this is a dispersion relation for waves that can move through this periodically driven uh, lattice system. Uh, and so if I would ask, what's the average velocity? Suppose I have fermions in here and I occupied every K state in this band. What's the average velocity? Well, the average velocity is just the average slope of this line. Uh, 
But because of the condition, this line has to actually wrap around an integer number of times uh, in the energy direction as they go around in K. The average slope of this line is, is quantized to be an integer times essentially the lattice constant divided by the driving period. So that's what you get here. There's a, there's a winding number. How many times this band winds around in the quasi energy direction as they go around the Brillouin zone? That actually corresponds to, in appropriate units, the average velocity uh, of all the particles in this band when it's full. Uh, and if I would turn that into a current that flows, it would tell me this exactly for a filled band, one particle uh, per driving period flows through the system. And that's another way of seeing quantized adiabatic transport that Thales predicted a long time ago uh, from the point of view of the Floquet band structure. In the Thales work, uh, this topological invariant was instead formulated as a turn number in a momentum time plane. And this winding number is equivalent to it. But as we'll see momentarily, there's some new insight we can gain by thinking of it in terms of this sort of chiral mode that exists in the Floquet band structure. Okay. Um, so what we know going back in history to Thales is that if I have an insulator, let's say the case of a band insulator, then if I modulate the parameters in the Hamiltonian adiabatically compared to the gap, so this is an insulator, it has a gap, it has a well-defined sense of an adiabatic modulation, uh, then after one cycle of adiabatic modulation, the charge pumped through the system is quantized as an integer number of particles for this period. Now, if instead of completely filling this band so that we're in an insulating state, we would just fill some, some of the modes and leave the other one empty, then first of all, the system is gapless. Uh, so there's no sense in which the drive modulation of parameters would be adiabatic. Uh, and therefore, there may be some current which is pumped per cycle of modulation, but it's completely non-universal and there isn't really any obvious way of guessing what it should be. Uh, so it doesn't look that interesting. Somehow the case when the band was completely full, you know, there we had this insulator and we have a quantized transport property. Uh, for a partially filled band, it looks like, okay, not very interesting, we could just move on. But what I wanna to propose to you now is that this problem actually gets more interesting if we take into account that these particles, say they're in electrons, whatever they are, allow them to interact with each other. And then let's ask what's gonna happen in that case. Now, because we're modulating the system in time, this is an example of a periodically driven system. Uh, and as we discussed earlier, uh, there's already a folklore out there that generically a periodically driven system, which is interacting, is supposed to heat up. Uh, so what should we expect out of the system as it starts to heat up? Well, to have an idea what to expect, it's useful to go back to the picture of the Floquet bands. You know, if we come back here, remember we have this, this lower band, which we had here in the static band structure, after modulating in time and looking at it in the Floquet picture, uh, this is this chiral mode, uh, which when it was completely filled, this told us that it was carrying the quantized current for theory. Now, if we allow the system to start absorbing energy from the drive through its interactions and heat up, imagine for a moment, you know, accept my word for this and we'll discuss why it's true. Imagine that it heats up, but all the particles stay within this blue band here. And there's no particles which are transferred to the opposite one. Uh, then eventually the system will reach uh, something which is similar to an infinite temperature or maximal entropy state, uh, subject to a constraint that all particles are in this chiral band. And then if you ask, what is the current that flows in this extremely high entropy state? Uh, in fact, it takes on the universal value, which is the winding number of this band, which is its average slope, times the density of particles which are there. So the key idea is essentially that although for any particular initialization, the current that flows could be anything just depending on what the velocities of the particular states where they were occupied. Uh, the natural heating we would expect to take place as we stir up the system would eventually wipe out 
all of the non-universal features of the band structure, no matter what kind of wiggles are here, uh, once the distribution is homogenized over all K states, we would actually see a current which just reflects the topological nature of the band and none of the non-universal features. Okay, so this is a, you know, a claim of what I expect to see in this case. Um, and now I'd like to demonstrate for you a, that it happens, and B, we can discuss more about why exactly this happens and, and not something else. Uh, any, any question about the setup or the claim? I mean, if uh, I assume you're going to explain in what situations I would expect to get two bands, A, that cross and anti-cross, and B, rather than both of them having winding number zero, and B, why when I drive, I, mean, I will stay within one. Oh, yeah, good, good point. So, so you know, in the first picture, I just drew this one chiral mode. Now we have also one that goes the other way and the color scheme is supposed to reflect what was here. Um, the reason that I drew two now and that they have opposite winding numbers is that there is actually um, a constraint that the sum of winding numbers of all these bands has to be zero. Um, and it's the same uh, mathematically as saying the sum of all turn numbers of all bands have to always add up to zero. Uh, so if I start with a local Hamiltonian and I, you know, drive, I modulate it in time, then I'll always end up with the sum of all these winding numbers being zero. So, so it's it's necessarily the case that they're going to cross somewhere, and it could be many times. And I'll show you. This is a sketch here, but I'll show you a realistic band structure for this in a little bit. And then the reason why heating. So in this picture. Uh, there's no obvious reason why you might expect heating to stay within this band and not go between them. And across, it looks like they're degenerate. And, and we'll discuss shortly uh, when there could be a separation of time scales between heating within the band and between bands. Um, so, so first, let's just take a concrete model so we can you know, discuss you know, concretely what's going on. So the simplest model that realizes this thalus pump essentially is a two band lattice model, sometimes called the rice melee model. Um, and there's a sub lattice potential, which is different on these say, white and gray sites, which are here. Um, and then the hopping intra unit cell and inter unit cell are different and modulated in time in some periodic way. Okay, and if we would uh, fill one band of this model, leave the other one empty, that's a classic realization of, of the thalus pump. So instead of filling a band completely and having a band insulating state, now I want to do what I told you before. And instead, let's half fill the lower band of the system. So now it's, it's not an insulator. It's a metal, in fact, when it starts. Um, and then start driving it. And oh, in addition to the sublattice potential and the hopping here, there's also interaction between particles. And, and there's going to be a fermionic model. Uh, and spin this fermion. So there's no interaction on site, but the interaction will be nearest neighbor when these two particles sit uh, in the unit cell together. Okay, so that's the form of interaction that's going to be present here. Um, and because we expect the system to heat up to a very high entropy state, uh, there's no use in trying to use any kind of matrix product states or anything like that. All we can do is exact evolution. It's actually the only impossible. So, so the numerics I'm about to show you uh, are for the biggest system we could do, which is eight particles in 32 sites. So it's a quarter filled system or half filled band. Um, and what you see right away is that over some relatively short time scale of you know, 10 or a few tens of periods, the current starting from some non-universal value that depends on initialization uh, quickly saturates around this value of a half. And this one half is exactly corresponding to the filling of the band. So we have the winding number, which is one, and then the density, which is half, half filling. Um, and two different colors here, red and blue, are for two different drive frequencies. Uh, on short time scales, there's not so much difference between the two, apart from these fluctuations. Uh, but what you see over a much longer time scale is that uh, the lower drive frequency uh, seems to stay in this quasi-stationary state with quantized or semi-quantized current for a very long time, thousands and thousands of periods. So, so this shows us 
or explicitly that there is a separation of time scales here that we can get into a state uh, where we've sort of uniformly occupied one of those two bands, the other one is empty and it can stay there for an extremely long time. So uh, you can take that as an observation or a numerical confirmation of that uh, hypothesis of what we expected to see. Now we're gonna dig into it a little bit more and also discuss why this, where the separation of time scales comes from. Uh, so there's actually a really helpful representation of the floquet band structure that helps to see why this heating may be su suppressed, this interband part of it. Um, and this is something that I think in you know, the early days when we were working on this problem, we hadn't appreciated as much as more recently. So I, I wanted to you know, share it in case it's useful for anybody else out there. So if we look at the Floquet band structure, this is the actual band structure now for that model that I just showed. Uh, what we see is that because we have to take the bands of the system and fold them into a zone, this quasi-energy Brillouin zone, which has a width h bar omega, uh, you know, there's many crossings here between the right and left moving bands. If, if we go to even lower frequency, this thing gets compressed even more, and it, eventually it starts to look like a mess. Um, but one thing we can see is that say, if we follow this blue band, you can see it's total winding number here. It crosses twice and it comes back once. So the net winding is, is one as advertised before. But from looking in terms of quasi energy, it appears that all quasi energies are as good as any others. Uh, and you might expect that scattering from this blue band to the red band, you know, is just as likely as scattering between two states in the blue band. Uh, but this sort of notion that a driven system doesn't know about energy, it only knows about quasi-energy, is a little bit too coarse. Uh, in fact, these floquet states, at least the single part particle floquet states, which are here, they do have some memory of where they came from in actual energy. Uh, and so it's possible to unfold this floquet quasi-energy spectrum uh, through the time average spectral function of the system. So this is spectral function defined from the single particle Green's function for particles in the system. Uh, because it's a driven system, the Green's function is a function of two times, but we can Fourier transform with respect to the time difference, the average over the other time, and end up with a spectrum that looks like this, uh, which looks something like the original band structure. You see something that looks kind of like bands, but there are all these side bands here, uh, which tell us that say one of these blue floquet states here, that's some value of K, maybe that's over here. Uh, it's comprised of many harmonics, many sidebands. Uh, but the important point is that the floquet states are localized in frequency space. And so the floquet states that originate from the lower band of the non-driven system, they're localized in this region of frequency. And the Floquet states originating from the original upper band or conduction band, they're localized in a different range of frequencies. If we fold this down into one zone, you can't see that, but the spectral function unfolds it. Um, so what you can see then from this picture is that suppose I start with you know, a couple of particles in the blue band. Uh, it's true that I can have a scattering event in which one of them you know, gets kicked to the red band, but the matrix element for them for that process to occur has to do with the tail. So there's these uh, the side bands which are here. There's a tail which is exponentially suppressed in frequency. The overlap of that tail with this band up here controls uh, the rate of that process. So as long as uh, um, question, yes. Uh, so this is the spectral function of which operator? Yeah, sorry. So yeah, me... can you define the spectral function? Actually, I was going to ask the same question. Okay, so it's a single particle Green's retarded Green's function. It's a function of two times because it's a driven system, uh, which we can actually write in terms of the different function t minus t prime, let's say t plus t prime over two. And then we're going to for a transform with respect to the time difference, that gives us omega. And then uh, this function here is periodic 
in this average time variable here. So if we we're going to average over one driving period of the second, and that's what produces this picture here. Um, so when you, when you say that it's the single particle Green's function, you mean that you are looking at the density operator, the fermionic density operator, and the spectral function of the fermionic density operator, or is it a, a propagator of the sort? Uh, it's a prop single particle propagator. Okay, um, but but um, since you had both the sort of kinetic term as well as the on-site potential term being driven. Uh, do you not need to worry about uh, whether you look at the spectral function of the hopping or whether you look at the spectral function of the density? Uh, so this is in, you know, in, in K. So we have uh, I theta T minus T prime, uh, C dagger K of T, C dagger K T prime. Um, okay, I guess there's also an alpha and there's two sub lattices. So we have an alpha and a beta index there, which we can trace over. So there's also a trace involved to get to this picture. Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, I have too, too many daggers here. There, yeah. Is that, is that uh, more clear? Yeah, that's clear. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, right. So, so what I was saying was these uh, single particle flow case states, they're, they're localized in frequency space. And essentially, as long as uh, the localization length and frequency is small compared to the gap between them, then we have a suppression of scattering from the blue to the red. Um, and can go through more rigorous arguments, but essentially what happens is uh, there are three scales which we need to compare to this instantaneous energy gap in order for uh, this interband scattering to be slow. Uh, first of all is the drive frequency itself, which sets the spacing of these uh, sidebands. We need to be, although there's no adiabatic limit since it's a gapless system, there's still the sense of adiabaticity relative to the single particle gap. So we need to have a small frequency compared to that gap. Essentially what it means is in order to excite an, a particle from here to here, I would have to absorb many photons, it's a high order photon absorption process. Uh, the bandwidth here uh, should also be small compared to the gap because I could also imagine a process where I have several particles near the top of the band, they can scatter down and one you know, scatters up. Uh, so if the bandwidth is too large, then it's also possible just once the system heats up, within the band to start scattering particles across uh, and also the interaction strength itself which will be small compared to the gap. But as long as all three of these scales are smaller than the single particle band gap, uh, then we end up with an exponential suppression in, in, the, uh, in these quantities, which guarantees a long lifetime for this quasi steady state here. Okay, so that's, that's the reason why Back here, I drew this uh, distribution homogenized within this blue band, but still no particles yet in the red one. If you wait long enough, then eventually they'll be scattering between them. And at very long times, the system will go to sort of infinite temperature over the whole system. But there's a long intermediate in the appropriate parameter regime where uh, we can think of it as an infinite temperature state, but just project it into a single band. Uh, that's really the key. Here and once we get into that state, it has this universal transport property uh, that reveals the topology of the underlying bouquet band. Okay, so a few features that uh, this thing has. So, so it's robust to disorder. In fact, disorder even improves the universality, or the I don't exactly want to call it quantization of the current because it's, it's not an integer, but it's, it's an integer times. The filling. And so what you see is uh, you saw before that there are fluctuations around this value of a half. Um, the intro introduction of potential disorder on sites actually reduce, tends to reduce those fluctuations. So it actually makes this current look uh, more quantized than it was before. Um, at the same time, 
disorder really has very little effect on the lifetime. So if we ask what's the rate at which the population starts to grow in the upper band, um, as a function of disorder strength, it's essentially flat um, until, you know, disorder can be as big as the bandwidth, still no change, but once it becomes comparable here with the single particle gap between bands, then eventually, in fact, there's a topological transition that takes it out of the non-trivial phase. Uh, and around the same time, also the heating starts to just take over. Uh, so in some way, disorder actually helps this phenomenon to be nicer than it was uh, in the clean system. Um, and while the current itself is, you know, one way of seeing that this quasi steady state of high entropy density was formed because we only would expect to see that uniform, this uh, universal value of the current uh, if the distribution is homogeneous over all case states, uh, it's only one measure. And, you know, another thing we might expect to see would be the entanglement entropy should also become very large and consistent with what we might expect um, in an infinite temperature state projected to a single band. Uh, so here, I'm just showing what happens. So uh, this is a plot of entanglement entropy as a function of time in this system. Um, and so what we've done is system has periodic boundary conditions. So actually it's a ring and if you make two cuts to separate it into two regions, uh, and then trace out, say trace out subsystem B and ask about the entropy of subsystem A. Um, and we see is it very rapidly you know, rises and converges to some value. The dashed line here is the value we would get from an infinite temperature state projected to one band. Um, and we see that it actually converges to something a bit less than that. Um, and that's to be expected for you know, a couple of reasons. One is that in fact, what we have here is not an infinite temperature state because it is a pure state of the system. So this maximal entropy density state that we expect to find at long times uh, is more like a typical state that one would draw from somewhere way up high in the spectrum. Uh, and there's some old work going back to Page on this, that if you look at the entanglement entropy of a given pure state, uh, say with energy density consistent with infinite temperature, that's different from the entropy you would get from the mixed state of, of, in, of infinite temperature. So, so this red line, which is here, is the correction that Page predicts that we would expect to see. And so, Okay, there's three different curves here. So let me explain it. Orange is uh, for the case where uh, the winding number is zero. So this is a topologically trivial driving protocol. So the pumped charge per cycle is zero. Um, and here, essentially, what you can imagine a caricature of it is I have a particle which sits in a 1EA orbital in a unit cell. Uh, the most trivial version of the trivial drive is it just sits there and nothing happens. Maybe it wiggles back and forth a tiny bit, uh, but particles on average aren't going anywhere. There's no pumping. Uh, and in this case, which is the orange curve, we see that the entanglement entropy grows and ends up being very close to uh, what we would expect in this you know, maximal entropy density state, subject to the conserved number of particles in the band. Um, the blue curve here, which oscillates, that corresponds to the phase where we have a winding number of one, where particles are being pumped continuously through the system. There it's important that here we have this entanglement cut. Uh, and over the course of every period, you know, I may start out with some one year orbital like this, but pumping means it's gonna move as a function of time. And after one period, that one year state is gonna be over here. Uh, so it's somewhere in the middle of the period that one EA orbital is gonna be cut in half by the entanglement cut. And we get an extra order one contribution here, which is this spike. So every time this spike comes here, we can actually connect that to the pumping itself. That there's a one EA orbital that's passing by the entanglement cut. And to check that that's actually the case, what's happened here in the gray 
curve, that's again a topologically trivial situation where the one year orbitals aren't moving on average. Uh, we've placed the entanglement cut through the center of the one year orbital. And so you can see the blue essentially just interpolates back and forth between the two cases. Uh, so this is what goes on then uh, in this quasi steady state. It really does look like the system has heated up to what we would call infinite temperature if we only looked at that one band. But the point is that this Floquet band actually has a non-trivial topological property to it, which is still reflected in its transport characteristics. So that's sort of the key message that comes out of this. Um, and this idea is not limited only to uh, this one-dimensional uh, quantized pumping scenario. We could imagine it for you know, anything. Suppose they have some low energy degrees of freedom, some high energy degrees of freedom. Uh, if I drive at a frequency which is small compared to this gap here, we may expect that after some time, the system will be completely heated up within the low energy sector. Uh, and in this high entropy state down here, all non-universal features of this low energy sector will be wiped out. But if there's any non-trivial topological character to it, that could be revealed. So you could imagine if this was a two-dimensional system and this is a churn band, that you know, there'd be some Hall conductivity left over, which is again, has a uh, you know, quantized part to it, but then multiplied by density or some other topological feature you may see there. So that's sort of just a, a paradigm for thinking about you now what we can get from, in one sense, very hot driven systems, which still have some non-trivial character left over to them. Okay, so that's uh, end of this part one of the talk. Are there any questions here? There's not a lot of time left, so I think I'll give you just the sort of I, overview version of the second part. Can I can I actually ask this question? Yeah. Um, so if you if you go back to the slide with the spectral functions, I mean, sorry about this, but this is one thing I'd like to ask there. So the figure that you have on the left, that's the band structure of the non-interacting system. Yeah, oh, sorry, maybe I should clarify. So both of these are for the non interact You could calculate this out of the states of the interacting system, but this is actually from the non-interacting system. They're both for the non-interacting system. Um, and were the sort of currents that you showed later on also because of the non, uh, also of the non-interacting system? No, the current, uh, the current is what you get from the interacting system just by time evolution. You start with some initialization uh, and then drive it. And after a few periods, you see that it gets into this uh, quasi steady state. If, if there are no interactions, the current would be you know, just the same as a function of time. It wouldn't equilibrate. Okay, so, so then my question is that if I go back to the non-interacting system's band structure, yeah. then, the, then the sort of two lines, the orange and the blue lines, are enough to give me the information about the system along with the eigenvectors. Um, so the only and the two eigenvectors corresponding to the blue and orange lines are orthogonal to each other. So the only reason you expect scattering would be because of the interaction, right? Yeah. So so then I'm completely confused about why would you talk about um, scattering like you have pointed with the red arrow in the upper right figure because the two bands are orthogonal to each other in the non-interacting limit. So there should not be any scattering any, in any case because the Floquet eigenstates of the non-interacting system are orthogonal. You know, th these arrows were meant to indicate, so I'm gonna just put two of them here, a two particle scattering process. So I have two particles, I can start in some, you know, K1 and K2 and they can scatter to some K3 and K4 and crystal momentum and quasi energy has to be conserved in that process. But mm -hmm. it could be an interband transition because it, I see, I see. Okay, so you're saying that because of this gap, once you switch on the interactions, the scatterings are suppressed. Yeah. Okay. There is scattering, right. it's suppressed. Right. Okay. So, but to, just to clarify, I mean, Mark, you mean that what you draw here is indeed a single particle, but you're now thinking once I switch on interactions, they allow the stuff that you're talking about, right? But there's yeah, it's, the, we can understand from these. Uh, this picture of the single particle spectrum, we can understand what happens in the interact when interactions are turned on. So that was the point. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, let me let me just briefly tell you what the point of the second part was. Uh, and then if people are interested, you know, I can stick around and we can discuss it further and just preview it. Uh, the, we're interested here in understanding the dynamics of an open many body system, in particular Markovian dynamics uh, here. Um, and, and I think what's a good place to start. So, so if I want to look at Markovian evolution of a density matrix, I have a system coupled to a bath very general setup for an open system. Uh, in general, the dynamics may be non-Markovian if there's an excitation which can go from the system to the bath and somehow come back sometime later. In general, I have to worry and have some memory kernel in order to describe the evolution of the system. But in a case where the memory time of the bath is sufficiently short, I can end up with the Markovian equation of motion for the reduced density matrix of the system alone. So it'd be some rho dot is some linear operator acting in rho. Uh, and for rho to be a valid density matrix, it should satisfy the properties of a density matrix. In permission, have a trace that's one, it should be a positive operator. And those conditions highly constrain uh, the form of what this right-hand side of this differential equation can look like. And long ago, mathematical physicist, Lindblad in particular, one with some others, figured out that the most general form that that differential equation can have is, is written right here. So if you write it in this form, it guarantees for us that at all times, rho will be uh, you know, still Hermitian, still have trace one, and will stay a positive operator, which is a pretty non-trivial condition to um, implement. Uh, okay, so the question we were after is under what conditions or, or how actually if we have a, a system and an environment, can we actually obtain an equation of this form and with it, the specific form of these L operators called the jump operators? And it's such a basic question, I wouldn't blame you for thinking or wondering, hasn't that already been answered before? But surprisingly, the answer is no. Uh, there's some specific situations in particular in quantum optics where it's known how to get this, but that required some additional, and as I'll tell you, unnecessary extra conditions on the system. And the results of this work is that we can get rid of those uh, and have a much more general derivation and tell you exactly what these L's are supposed to be. Um, and so, you know, in the interest of time, I can tell you what the key point is in the quantum optics context. Uh, there we have a system with a discrete, you know, big energy space in between levels. Uh, even after levels are broadened by their finite lifetimes, they're still well separated. And, and mathematically, this allows for a rotating wave approximation or something called the secular approximation. And that's how actually this equation gets derived. Uh, but there's an additional very strong requirement that the level spacing is big compared to decay rates. And in a many body system, this is not the case. We have a very dense spectrum and the levels overlap. Uh, and what that means is it basically breaks down the derivation that was available in the past to arrive at this Lindblad form. And the best you could do was get something, for example, this something called block Redfield equation, which uh, is Markovian, but doesn't preserve positivity of the density matrix and various other features of it are not as nice as having this Lindblad form. Uh, so what we identified in this work was that in deriving, let me just back up once. In deriving this uh, Markovian equation of motion, uh, this is a block red field that I mentioned, uh, there's a particular step where there's an approximation made where the memory kernel, uh, I'll say it this way, uh, well, there's an approximation made that we make this equation of Markovian. Initially, uh, we had to integrate over a history. And the way this Markov approximation is made is not unique. Uh, and in fact, there's a better way than the one that's in the textbook. And if you're interested, I can tell you what it is. But just to come uh, to the results, and then we can go to the discussion. Uh, what came out of this work, and the paper is, is here, just came out uh, late last year, is a number of things. Uh, first of all, and there's a number of rigorous bounds and conditions that we derived along the way 
to tell you exactly what the errors are at every step. Uh, there's a there's a an exact bound, in fact, on the rate of change of the density matrix, uh, basically the rate of evolution of the density matrix of the system due to its coupling to the bath uh, that comes out of it, uh, framed in terms of this quantity gamma. Uh, so there's characteristic rate gamma that we can identify in terms of something which is related to the spectral function of the bath. It's actually related uh, to the square root of the spectral function of the bath. Uh, and a characteristic time scale of the bat. Uh, so the conditions that justify this Lindblad equation uh, are essentially that the product of this rate and this time scale is much less than one. Um, and from a practical point of view, maybe the most useful thing that comes out is an explicit form for what the jump operators should be. And the crucial point is, whereas in the quantum optics case, required this large level spacing in the system in order to derive it, there's absolutely no condition about what the level structure of the system looks like here. So that's in the title, I said it was called the universal Lindblad equation. Universal here refers to the fact that uh, I can apply to any system you want. The, the justification for it is only uh, reliant on the bath itself uh, and the strength of the system bath coupling to make sure that uh, the dynamics are more coding. Um, so maybe, you know, since time is late, I'll put the summary and we can have a discussion. There's more I can say about that if you're interested. Um, but the first part took a little longer than I anticipated, so we didn't have too much time there. Anyways, yeah, so, so thanks. And uh, yeah, I hope we can continue the discussion further now. All right, thank you. Um, does, does anybody have any questions now? Um, that they've been saving up. So, I mean, if, if, if not, then I, I wouldn't mind if Mark explained the universal Lindblad equation further. But I mean, the, the, the talk is over, right? You can only leave if, you, yeah, if you're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let me just go a little bit more slowly then uh, back here. Uh, so, so before you say that, actually, I do have a question on the earlier part. Yeah. Um, um, so I think at some point you said that if you have stronger disorder, at some, you know, nothing happens until at some point the disorder is strong enough that, you know, it's comparable to the bandwidth, to a single particle that gets bandwidth, and then there's topological transition and the whole thing sort of, you know, hits up, right? Yeah. So, I mean, is this like a feature of the specific model that you are dealing with? You're saying that the gain mele model has a transition at this point, and that is what changes? or it's actually an interesting question. So there are two things that happen. There's, as disorder increases, there is a topological transition. Uh, also, as disorder increases, you know, once we have disorder, uh, in some sense, the gap is, is decreasing. I mean, for any particular disorder realization, there'll be some states which get pushed up. Uh, and what was saving us from interband excitations was the fact that we had this um, you know, localization in frequency space. But if I have some localized states which are getting in the middle of the gap here, eventually that gives me a route to scatter into them and the heating turns on. So the relation between the heating taking off and the topological transition is something we actually we wanna explore further. It's not clear if one happens first or you know, how they're related to each other. I think it's an interesting question actually. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, was there anything else about the first part? If not, then let me let me just. I mean, if not, yeah, I I, I wouldn't find at all. Basically. Yeah. Okay. So so the idea is um, so there's this block Redfield equation, which you know that's in the textbooks, and just a quick reminder how to get there. You basically expand the evolution uh, and to assume that initially the system in the bath were in a product state. Uh, and then the Born approximation, essentially just like in scattering, the Born approximation says we're only going to update the wave function of the system in bath. We're evolving the whole system in bath together initially. We're going to update the state only the first order in your coupling. That's this inner commutator here. Um, and then trace out the bath. 
sorry, sorry, stupid question. So X of T is the system operator with which the bath happens. Yeah, yeah, sorry. So it's back to the picture. So we have an operator X in the system, operator B in the bath. Uh, here I'll show just for the case of a single product, but it's easily generalized in the paper to, to any sum over such operators. Um, for now, let's say X is the system operator. Um, okay, and then we trace out the back, and then we get to something of this form here. Um, and then the part I wanted to focus on is the Markov approximation, because that's really where the new aspect is going to come in. So first of all, this J, which is here, this is the um, correlation function of the back, defined down here in the cor corner. Uh, and this is a function which, you know, it decays say pretty quickly. Um, and the Markov, so before we make the Markov approximation, this density matrix here is a function of time. So this is not yet Markovian because we see that the left-hand side depends on rho at previous times. Uh, the Markov approximation says if this function decays very quickly, then let's just erase the prime over there. Uh, and that'll be approximately true because as long as rho doesn't change very much over the time scale where this function decays to zero, I might as well just take it at the end, at the end of this interval. So that's the classic way the Markov approximation is made. Uh, it gives us this block Redfield equation, which is not in Lindblad form. Uh, and then we're basically stuck. Uh, so the essence, the paper itself is kind of long and you know, there's a lot of technical details in there, but I can give you the essence of what happened. The essence was uh, basically to say this way of making a Markov approximation of essentially just replacing rho by its value at the end of this interval here. Uh, that's not the only way to do it. Uh, instead, we can try to take a more democratic approach, which in some way averages over this correlation time uh, of the bath. And the way it works uh, is to break open this uh, correlation function through its square root essentially, in square root in the sense of a convolution. So I can write this I can write J as a convolution of this G. And in Fourier space, that just means that G is the square root of the spectral function. Uh, so I've broken it open. And then we take rho and bring it down here. Uh, but instead of using t, the final time of this integral, interval, or t prime, which was there before, I actually use rho of s, which is the integration variable in this convolution. And that's the sense in which sort of uh, averages over this history during the decay of correlations of the back. And you may ask, you know, why do it exactly in this way? Uh, and well, for one, you know, it looks kind of more democratic, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But what, what I can say is if you do it this way, then immediately we end up after a few more tricks of you know, rearranging limits of integration, we end up in a Lindblad form master equation, which is guaranteed to preserve positivity of the density matrix. Uh, and also it has other nice properties like it can be solved by uh, stochastic evolution of pure states. And for many body system, that's really key because if you need to solve this equation, you need in a many body system, you need the many body density matrix, which is really big uh, compared to a pure state. And you have to square, square the dimension of this operation of this uh, object in a memory of the computer. Uh, but a Lindblad master equation, you can actually solve just by e evolving pure states stochastically and that can allow you to access much bigger system sizes. So there, there are several reasons why we want this doing that form. And, and doing this Markov approximation turns out to give us that nice form. Uh, and along the way, uh, there are all of these sort of additional results we get. We got some rigorous conditions on when this is uh, valid and how big all the errors are. There's lots of bounds given in the appendices. Uh, an explicit form for this jump operator. Now, one thing about this jump operator, uh, this M and N, which are here, and these E's, these are many-body eigenstates and energies. And you know, 
from a conceptual point of view, that's fine. Uh, from a practical point of view, that means that you do need to do some kind of exact diagonalization in principle to get what these jump operators are. Okay, but that's the way it is. You know, this is what nature tells us. We want to have a Markovian evolution of the many body system. That's what it's going to look like. But fortunately, there's also uh, sort of perturbative construction we can use for them. So if uh, Hamiltonian is local and its interaction with the bath is local, you can expect that the jump operates up operator should still be quasi-local. Uh, and what you can actually show, we have, you can see it down here, it's okay, some nasty looking expression, but the right way to think about it is uh, in terms of operator spreading. So, you know, imagine I have a system of qubits uh, and they're coupled to bat. So the, the most naive thing to do is say, each one has a T1 and a T2. It can flip or it can lose its face. Uh, but if those qubits are coupled to each other, then the, actual you know, errors or jump operators that can, jumps that can happen in the system won't be just happening on individual qubits because uh, you know, maybe the qubit interacted with its bath, but during the time when before it's had its jump, uh, it interacted with its neighbor. Uh, so there's an operator spreading that occurs. Say there's a you know, sigma minus that's gonna flip the spin down. Uh, that operator, in terms of a Heisenberg evolution, it's going to start to spread and it'll become some string of Pauli's. Uh, and it'll grow this operator string within the correlation time of the back. And essentially, that string, which has appeared over that time scale, that's the jump operator that you're going to get. And, and this, uh, these expressions here you know, formalize that and will tell you exactly how to, how to construct this thing. Uh, so, those are the main results. And the last one is if you have a time dependent Hamiltonian, this thing was initially inspired by thinking about periodically driven system. It also tells you that the right thing to do, as long as, so the rate, rate of change of the Hamiltonian is slow compared to this correlation time of the bath, according to this scale here, the right thing to do is to actually take the instantaneous uh, eigenstates and calculate jump up, instantaneous jump operators from them. And the error that you make in doing that is, is characterized here. So that's sort of a more detailed summary of what came out of this work. Oh, yeah, thanks. That was, that was interesting. Clear. I mean, does anybody have any other questions up to this point? Yeah, can I ask something here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah very nice talk. So I wanted to, in the end, um, what is the difference compared to the traditional uh, uh, born approximation? I mean, do you, you you still get a rate that depends on the spectral density of the bath at the transition frequency, right? Um, where to go here? Right. So um, okay. So it's very good. So so let's let's compare. So in the quantum optics case. Uh, you know, we had this discrete spectrum. This is where previously we could derive this Lindblad form and we get these jump operators and we get a rate, like you said, which had the, or the jump operator itself had square root of the spectral function of it inside it. What's important here is that uh, in this quantum optic case, every transition is well resolved and the jump operators that I get, I have a separate jump operator for every possible transition. And, and one way to understand that is if I would look at the color, say this is an atom and there's light that's gonna be emitted, by looking at the color of the light, I know exactly which level decayed into which other one. Uh, so a, this is a sum here over many different jump operators, one per transition between eigenstates. What happens here in the many body case where the transitions are not well resolved and there's no way by looking at the photon that came out to tell which transition occurred. Uh, here, one jump operator, there's only one jump operator that comes and it's a sum of many terms. So even though it, it's true, it still has a very similar form. Uh, it's different in the sense that we don't have you know, one jump operator per transition. We have a jump operator, which is a sum. Uh, in the case, that we have a large level spacing in the system and it satisfies all those conditions of quantum optics, 
this will reduce to give you the same answer. And so it's equivalent okay. in that limit, but it also works outside of it. Uh, and in this way, you know, it captures the case where I would have degeneracies or various things that would be outside of what uh, the quantum optical master equation could describe. Thank you. So, I mean, if I understood correctly your answer here, so basically my question here is, tell me if what I would say is correct, is that this is equivalent when they both work, but it works in situations where the other wouldn't because of the many body spectrum being. Exactly, that correct? That's exactly okay. the point. And, you know, we can see, you know, in a many body system, the eigen, the quantum optics case, it's transitions between eigenstates. The many body eigenstates are totally non-local and crazy. You, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't expect physically that's what jump operators should look like. Uh, they should be in some way, you know, local or quasi-local. And this summation, which is here, uh, it's over all those many body eigenstates, but the coefficients know that, in a, you know, it's encoded in them that they'll end up giving you some kind of quasi-local operator. And that's what I was trying to describe with this operator spreading. But in fact, even though you have this representation in terms of many body eigenstates, actually what it's describing is some quasi-local operator that acts on the system. And I can can, you show, can you show the next, yeah, thank you. Hmm? I was going to say, can you show this for a few seconds? Sorry. Yeah, so it's constructed through these, this is just a bunch of nested commutators essentially uh, that you can use to perturbably uh, construct this quasi-local operator. But why do you say the operator is quasi-local? If I look at the first line, for example, so clearly I'm not understanding this. I mean, I mean don't be shy to tell me I don't understand anything. Well, should we stop the recordings, Laco? <laughs> <laughs>